um, with a couple of thoughts. And my intent really is to sort of see, see the discussion here. And there's a main theme, though, of what I have to say, because I've been around technology and education for a long time. Um, I've worked with the New Schools Project since coming to North Carolina over four years ago. Um, it's been a pleasure to do so. But I really think, looking back, we've often added technology to things we're already doing. It's been an addition, not a fundamental change. And I think at this point, we're really at a point we have to go back to basic principles, re-examine them in light of the kinds of changes that Jim and Bob and Tony talked about, and really think about whether we need to reframe things, flip things, really look at more fundamental changes. So that's the, the overall theme. See if this is working. A couple of context assumptions. When you're asked to do this kind of talk, you start thinking about all the things you could say about context. Fortunately, prior speakers covered some of these. And so we just have to postulate some things. We don't have time to dig into all the details. But first, as a reminder, we're thinking about what are now called Generation Z students. Students who were born in the late 20th century, early 21st century, and to the folks who've been around uh, a number of years like myself, to remember that kids entering school this year will graduate in 2024. Okay? It really is a, a new era. As Jim talked about, we're in a global, networked, information-rich, rapidly changing world. You know all about that. And in this world, technology is so central to the Generation Z kids' lives. I have two kids in high school. Um, Bob mentioned his two-year-old, their social lives, their entertainment, their finding information, but even their own sense of identity and their own sense of developing their own voices is fundamentally tied to technology. This is very, very different than it was even a short time ago before all the mobile technologies, smartphones, et cetera, where technology is something you went to and did, not something that you carried with you and used 24-7. <laughs> and I know my 15-year-old daughter sends and receives 1,000 text messages a month. So I mean, it's just a constant use of, of what they do. The next one I think we don't discuss enough, but I think is very, very important and relates to the New Schools Project work. We've always had our students learn to know, know that, to know information, to have knowledge in their head, and also to know how, skills and use of information, how to problem solve, et cetera. But the balance between knowing that and knowing how has changed because they're all walking around. I left my phone there. But with this little device that they can instantly access so much of the that's of the world. And they now need to know much more about how to find the right that, how to evaluate it, how to synthesize it, how to communicate it, how to solve problems with it. And I think this balance between knowing that and knowing how, um, which goes back a long time in some of the education work, is going to be a fundamental issue as we move forward. And we all know that schools have great traditions, play a critically important role, but change is not one of the great strengths of schools. And it's so valuable that we have the new schools project to foster and feed new models throughout the state. Um, but it's very, very difficult work to change schools at the scale we need. OK. Given that, I want to go back to the New Schools Project design principles. And I checked with Tony and said, yep, these are all the up-to-date ones. And they're, they're all good principles. Um, first one is a sort of mom and apple pie, prepare students for their futures, to engage in deep instructional change for powerful teaching and learning, to set up schools that really personalize education for students, where every student is known by individuals, where what they learn, how they learn it, is customized to themselves. The next one, I think, combines two principles on the official list, but that teacher leadership, staff leadership, collaboration, and professional growth are important. And as Tony pointed out, I absolutely agree. The quality of the teacher is the key to all of this. And then rethinking the use of time, space, and resources. I plan to focus on two of these in the 10 minutes that I have. I know that some of the other speakers, Barbara Tracy and Monica Baglow, who I've had the pleasure of working with over many years, will focus on staff leadership, collaboration, and professional development. And I know we'll, we'll all be hitting some of the other items. Looking at this issue of deep instructional change for powerful teaching and learning, the New School Project also has an instructional framework consisting of the six elements up there, collaborative group work, writing to learn, literacy groups, questioning, scaffolding, and classroom talk. And if time allowed, we could fill in more about what those means. But I think just the titles give you a general idea. 
And one of the things I'd like to raise for the panel, and I guess they're over there, so I should look over there at the panel, my panel, is these are 20th century. This is a 20th century framework, I would argue. It's good because in many schools, we still have a 19th century instructional framework. So it's an advance over what we have. But I think it's time to really look back at these and think about, do these need to be updated and changed? So one of the things I'd like to raise, and I have no idea, I'm not claiming these are the right changes, but just to see the discussion, collaborative group work, these kids work together. They divide up tasks. They play different roles in it. There's a whole model of collaborative group work in education. But is that enough now? Or do we need to be talking about something more like collaborative project-based learning with classmates and many others outside the school? The framework of collaborative learning, as it's written, implies it happens in the classroom. It doesn't open the door to it happening virtually with people around the world, supported by information, communications, and collaborations technology. You know, many of you in technology businesses put all types of collaborative technologies to use. You have people working together who are physically located around the world. How do we think about reframing this idea of collaborative group work in a classroom around these changes? Um, writing to learn. IBM had a product called Writing to Learn in the uh, early 80s, I guess. Um, but now, it's really not just writing anymore. We need to talk about learning through communicating ideas using the varied and appropriate media of expression. Knowing how to use tools for a presentation, knowing how to create videos, knowing how to create multi linked multimedia presentations has now become very, very important. It's not just about the prior concept of writing. Uh, literacy groups, great to have kids reading together, discussing what they read. None of this says what's here should not continue. It's that we need to reframe it and add more. Should this be something more like working with peers to find, interpret, evaluate, synthesize, and communicate information from the full range of text and digital resources available? If we continue on quickly knowing the time, um, questioning. And questioning is a critical skill for teachers, asking questions that really engage kids, get their ideas on the table, have them discuss them is critical. But questioning changes when you think of questioning in the box of the classroom. And going back to the knowing that versus knowing how, the kinds of questions kids can respond to, the way they can address questions has fundamentally changed. And how do we capture that in these principles for teaching and learning? Um, scaffolding is an interesting one, has a great tradition in education and educational psychology. The idea that you want to connect, help students connect what they're learning now to what they've already known. Well, we now have concepts of distributed intelligence and various others that say, it's not just what you're carrying around in your head. How do we think of scaffolding in this world where so much is available and how you can link what you know and what you can use and what you have access to rather than just what's in your head. Um, classroom talk, again, that is framed in the principles as what goes on in the classroom, not thinking about continuing it virtually with synchronous and asynchronous kinds of discussions. And then there's lots of possible additions, and I just threw a couple there to, to try to seed some of the discussion. One of the things that technology brings is all kinds of primary resources. Right? You have the Library of Congress historical resources available, you have all kinds of original data, et cetera. Do we need to have within our principles, particularly for STEM schools, the use of primary resources, the use of inquiry, the use of problem posing, the use of publishing by students, and the focus on not just learning, but learning to learn that is so critical. So some ideas to see the discussion about that. And I don't know where the timekeeper is, but I'm going to keep going till I uh, see, get the hook. Um, the other thing I'd like to talk about very quickly is this question of rethinking the use of time, space, and resources. And here I'd like to use a specific example, and actually we're doing some work with Discovery Learning on some of these kinds of ideas, this concept of flipping the classroom. Um, this is important not to say the particular concept is right, but it's an attempt to say, let's really look at the big picture and not just stick with the structures we have and say, how do we add on or how do we patch them? But think about really changing things. The key idea here is that in most classrooms, particularly at the high school level, most of the classroom time is spent with the teacher presenting information. Okay? And teachers struggle to keep the kid's attention, to 
address the different levels and learning needs, et cetera. And a colleague of mine, Lodge McCammon, has been reading some very interesting work. We set up a very simple YouTube type model with sliding whiteboards so that teachers could easily create videos of their presentations. Okay? One of the first discoveries is when teachers spend 45 minutes in a classroom presenting, when they do it on video, it takes them 10 minutes. That so much time is dealing with classroom management, repeating things, checking that kids are doing something else, et cetera, et cetera. It's an amazing, inefficient use of time in the classroom. Okay? Um, that when done on video, one, teachers no longer have to repeat the same presentation. Many of our teachers have four or five classes. Students can view it on their own as homework. The flip is that what used to go on the class is now homework. Okay, students can view it on their own time. They can take it at their own pace. They can repeat it. They can text message their friends with questions. They can answer some questions the teacher gives. Their parents can see it. Lots of advantages that come out of that. And then classroom time is freed up for all that stuff we always talk about of inquiry-based learning, collaborative learning, problem solving, direct um, tutoring from the teachers, kids working together in different ways, et cetera. Many of you have probably heard of the Khan Academy model. Sal Khan has done amazing work. He has support from the Gates Foundation. Um, what Lodge McCammon is developing is different in a fundamental way that goes back to Tony's opening comments. We have a fundamental belief that it's of critical value that it be the student's own teacher that creates these videotapes. Otherwise, it has a sense of your outsourcing to, to Sal Khan out in California. He has his way. Our style has the teacher's face prominent with the whiteboards for some notes. And it's part of developing the teacher-student relationship. And it's the same teacher who then is in the classroom. That therefore, the students know the teacher really knows this, has his or her own way of presenting it. The parents can see the teacher presenting it, and there can be follow-up. We think the con stuff is useful, but we don't think it's the right model for flipping the classroom. We think it has to be a personalized model that values teachers. And I'm getting the uh, signal that I'm done, so I'm done. I won't say more about this. There are some links to this flipping kind of thing and some model approaches on the web, and perhaps we can talk more about it later. Okay, thank you all.